Um, but today our session title is Come to the Table, Reflections on Quakerism and Preparing the Table for What Comes Next. So Taz is a, is a colleague of ours. He does the database management um, for all of our um, contacts and we would be lost without him. Um, and <laughs> Gretchen today has asked um, Taz to introduce her because a colleague that's known her for many years and I couldn't agree more it's a wonderful choice so Taz would you like to introduce Gretchen? Hello um, Gretchen is the general secretary of FWCC and is the best boss in the world um, <laughs> more formally um, so she's the general secretary at the um, World Office of the Friends World Committee for Consultation which is in the basement of Friends House in London um, and she serves on CUNA in New York and Geneva, travels among Quakers worldwide, and participates in the Christian World Communion's annual meeting of the General Secretaries, where she is the first woman chair and the first Quaker chair. As part of the latter affiliation, she attended the inauguration of Pope Francis in 2013. Gretchen grew up in the United States, in Iowa, as the daughter of a Quaker pastor. She served many different Quaker organizations, including as presiding clerk of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, director of leadership development for some Quaker retirement communities, and as board development consultant for over 20 years. She has a master's degree in organization development and adult learning, and her primary work has been in organizational change, board development, and strategic thinking. Grounded in faith, her work for and with Quakers is a lifelong commitment to bringing love into fuller, fuller illumination where the vision for a peaceful world and the hope for all people to live productive lives might take root. Gretchen has two grown daughters in the United States. She lives in the United Kingdom with her husband, David, and they love to play music together. Gretchen also enjoys gardening and fabric arts. And with that, I think I'll hand over to Gretchen. Many thanks, Taz. That's very, very kind of you. Um, thank you. I'm very excited. My mother is on this call today and my sister. So that's a really sweet, sweet to have them with us today. So what a privilege it is just to be speaking today, to be here with you. It has been such a huge honor to serve all friends these nine years. It's been, uh, quite amazing. I feel so grateful to be a Quaker. It gives meaning to my life to know God through the Quaker experience. I structure my life in ways that conform to the Quaker way. And that is both comforting and freeing. So let us come to this table today and enjoy each other's company and conversation. The table was known to Jesus as a place to give blessing, to break bread together, and to give to those who were ready to listen. It becomes a place to remember the blessings of God and to experience joy and grace. It is also a place to heal brokenness and regret to allow others to affirm each of us as contributors and as children of God. I have shared meals with friends in many parts of the world, exceedingly grateful for the meal and the loving hands that prepared it. But more importantly, I remember the spiritual nourishment that came from sitting around the table, delighted to be in each other's presence gifts of the spirit that sustain us. We know the value of relationship and of community. I have watched as we expand the table, bringing around more tables and chairs as an act of encouragement for everyone to gather. Our table is huge and our welcome is palpable. Quakers and many people of faith are given to the world to represent God in the world. God wants us to rescue and renew his and our creation. 
We are called to God's mission. We are called to be co-creators with God. So I wanna tell you a story. And this includes Simon Lamb, who is also here on the call. He's our, the clerk of FWCC. So Simon and I traveled together to Burundi. There we found the most generous welcome, gathering around many tables with a wide variety of friends. One sunny Sunday morning, having attended a church service in which seven different choirs performed and small babies were blessed and many other things happened in that worship, it was lovely. I felt spiritually refreshed. Afterwards, we were taken for fellowship to an open air building. And there we were served a most beautiful meal. Leaders of the church of the Quaker church gathered to ask us questions and to engage in dialogue. We talked about the phenomenal peace work that Burundi and friends initiated, about how Kuno's work is based on quiet diplomacy and deep listening and about their ecumenical work supporting unity within diversity and resisting some among them who think ecumenical work is about creating one church. Our discussion was deep and probing. And I have thought about that day quite often. And I'm grateful that as friends from different parts of the world, we care so often about the same things. We related to each other with great respect and a deep appreciation that we worship the same God under the same sun, speaking the language of the heart. I've experienced this time and time again. Having traveled among friends, I can say with great confidence that the global Quaker community is alive and well. When we seek each other out and love one another, despite our differences, we find great joy. And I wanna tell one more story. This time it's about when I had first arrived in PSAC, Peru. I had been working with the Africa section and um, you know, Bonito will appreciate this, he's on the call. Many of you will know this story. But I had worked with the Africa section to secure 31 Kenyan visas, which had proved to be very, very challenging for a wide variety of reasons. But sitting at a table in PSAC, I got a phone call to say that the 31 visas had been issued, but the passports were in Cairo and the African friends were to leave from Nairobi the following day. I was in tears, it felt horrible. So that evening I gathered a few people together to see if there was anything to be done. At 11 p.m. we agreed to ask a friend, Fred Ashmore, to fly from London to Cairo to pick up the passports with the visas and then to fly down to Nairobi via Dubai because there was no direct flight he would meet the friends at the Nairobi airport just as they were boarding their reissued flights. So after that 11 o'clock decision by 6 a.m. Fred Ashmore texted me that he had booked his flights and was on the way to the airport. And that's exactly what he did. It, it was amazing, it worked, you know, it worked. So when our friends from Kenya arrived at the conference, everyone was outside to greet them. It was just the happiest moment I can remember, hugging everyone and just laughing. And we were so happy to have them joining us. We could not have had the World Plenary Meeting with part of our family missing. It was a precious awareness that we truly need each other and we will do whatever it takes to be together. If we can learn to appreciate and use our diversity well, we have the hope of creating peace in the world. My prayer is that Quakers and other people of faith can be united across the globe in treating all humanity with respect and love 
raising one another up with a tender hand in the words of Isaac Pennington. This is for me the basis of setting the table for the future. COVID has given us a rich opportunity to reset, to recalibrate our thinking, our systems, our ways of life. We have many, many assumptions to disrupt and narratives to rewrite. We have a lot of soul searching ahead of us with God as our guide. We need to keep coming to the table. We need to know that our strength comes from God. We need to know the importance of our community support as we give and receive love for one another. We need to invite new people, perhaps those who are unsure of their faith, as well as those who have things to help us in our own understanding. We need to nurture our Quaker communion and recognize it as a place of belonging and strength. What does this mean for us? So I've listed 10 wishes. Number one, being open to God's transformative love, being made new all the time, learning and reaching for new ways to be in the world. Number two, being comfortable with coming to the edge, you know, just walking right out to the edge and being okay being there, living with ambiguity, finding new flight patterns, finding ways to serve God's purpose. Number three, admitting our flaws, our humanness, our mistakes, but not dwelling on them, but forgiving ourselves and others. Number four, finding a stronger expression of our theology, of our testimonies, or is in Africa, they're often called values, and our faith. Number five, being strong and persistent in our work for justice and peace. We never give up, we keep at it. This is one of the things I dearly love about being a Quaker. We just keep at it. Number six, be curious about what we don't yet know and pray for God's guidance in opening us up to evolving awareness. I've always thought that Quakers, because we are a very thoughtful uh, communion that we have, um, we are sensitive, we, we're good at sensing how the world is evolving, how we are evolving. Number seven, come to life with a generosity of heart. Number eight, love God with all your heart. Number nine, be grateful for every day. And number 10, love one another. So I wanna close with one of my favorite scriptures, John 15, nine to 17. It reads, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father 
I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command that you love one another. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Gretchen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Gretchen. It's not um, usual for Quakers to clap. Um, I wonder if we could all, uh, yeah, thank you. Leading by example, so Gretchen gets a sense of, of us on the call. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. You've touched my heart, Gretchen. <laughs> Very inspiring, Gretchen. Thank you. Okay, I am from a um, an unprogrammed um, background in Quakerism, so I am going to encourage us to have a moment's pause um, just before we go into our breakout rooms, but together, pause together um, in silence. And then I will give the next instruction, but let us just pause together. Thank you, friends. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, I know that some of us are up very late or up very early. It's not all um, one o'clock in the afternoon or almost for all of you. So thank you again for being with us. And it really is a joy to be together. So we have 40 minutes left of our time today. And we're going to have as many questions as we can get through. Um, and before we start calling on people, we do have some questions that people filled in um, in their registration form. So thank you. Um, and Gretchen, I'm going to I'm going to start with one of those today. So I'll spotlight you in a moment. But while I ask you the question, I'll let, I'll let you see my face. <laughs> so one of the questions that I've um, picked out for you, Gretchen, that I think will be good for you to answer is, how does the impact of Quakers on our world today compared with that of the 17th century Quakers of their world? Wow. I'll Very put cool. it in the chat so you can see, but do you want to go ahead with that one first, just to start yeah. off light? <laughs> very, very good question. Yeah, I think it's, it's you know, I think of the early Quakers as being so evangelical and so uh, full of, you know, the immediacy of the, of the spirit and of, uh, so, so, you know, uh, my family came from uh, Lancashire in England and uh, because of being religiously persecuted, you know, moved to the, to the colonies then. Um, so there was just that great fervent uh, energy. I think today, you know, we have a, a great sense of urgency and need, but it's different. It's kind of like the world I sense that the world needs us. You know, our urgency is more of like how how can we bring what we know uh, through our faith, through our Quaker faith. How can we bring some of that to the world? How can we bring God's kingdom to earth? Is, in my view, uh, a bit more of our of our attention and focus today. Thank you, Gretchen. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to open the floor now to um, everybody else because I, I imagine we've got plenty of questions. I'm going to uh, and thank you to Nancy for the reminder to myself to speak a bit slower. <laughs> I did say at the beginning, I speak quickly. It's only because I get excited. Um, so 
you can use the raise hand function, which you can find in the reactions um, box. If you raise your hand there, I'll be able to see who has a question and I can call on people accordingly. So if you do have a question, I encourage you to raise your hand now. Gordon. Gordon. Yeah, I'm going to call on Gordon. Um, I was sort of, take, sort of taken a, a little bit by surprise um, by being called straight away. Um, Gretchen, it's great to, to hear you. Um, and I'm, I only learned recently that you're going on to um, Erlen College. Um, that's wonderful, and I, I wish you and David um, God's blessing. Thank you. Um, and my question relates to education and, um, and also our, our role as Quakers in the world. And um, I, hope it, I hope it's not an unfair question, but I'd like to hear whatever thoughts you might have about the role of the Quaker schools in Ramallah and Brahmana. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. It's, it's wonderful to, to see you and thank you for your question. Um, I was on the EMIS annual meeting call during which we heard from uh, heads of school from both Ramallah and Brumana. And, uh, you know, it was heartbreaking, you know, to hear how they struggle. And it was inspiring to hear how they stay resilient. You know, the resilience, and Joyce Anjluni from a, the American Friends Service Committee talks a lot about the resiliency of her people. She's herself Palestinian. Um, and, you know, I've, I've always admired Jean Zaru and her ability to stay resilient and positive, even as she tells stories that are just really heartbreaking. And, you know, being in a part of the world where uh, the inequities are just so stark and, uh, you know, the, uh, the injustice is just uh, unbelievable. So in terms of our Quaker role, I think uh, e even in that call on EMIS, the, the heads of school were so heartened by hearing people around the world who say, we support you, you know, you're doing great work, stay, keep at it, you know, thank you for talking to us about it, helping us understand what it's like for you. And I think that's, you know, in terms of education and understanding one another, always kind of asking, well, what is it for you? How can I better understand what it's like for you? To me, that's a marvelous intention and question to want to know, to be curious, to, to find out, and then, and then to be as responsive as we can to what, to what the needs are. That's a, such a difficult situation in the Middle East, isn't it? But, Quakers are there. They that little meeting, you know, has international visitors all the time, and so they are almost an internationally oriented meeting. But they welcome that international, uh, not just Quaker, but the international influence, and and I think that really buoys them up. So I hope that answered uh, your question. Yes, thank you, Gretchen. You're welcome. Thank you, Gretchen. Margaret, I'm going to call on you next. You're muted, Margaret. When I visited the Quaker community in Eastern Congo, it was their evangelism really shone out. Um, the people com finishing their um, training at the College of the Great Lakes, training as pastors, were given a hymn book because as a pastor it's your duty to go out and evangelize and what's better than singing hymns? 
Um, and the legal representative of the Congolese Quakers had to spend six, eight months in Kinshasa trying to sort out legal problems with their registration. And he said, well, I'm an evangelist. So I went out and started holding street corner meetings and established two Quaker meetings in the time he was there. I don't know if they've kept going. I hope they have. But that um, willingness, confidence to go out and share contrasts with our very, very quiet British Quakers. And that's more an observation than a question, but reflect. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Margaret, and thanks for sharing that. It's it really does uh, highlight, uh, you know, our differences. We have some vast differences in how we come to our Quakerism, and it's marvelous to have all of that. You know, the the that fervor of you know speaking the word, and the uh, the quietness, the mystical part of our religious. Uh, family that makes it hard to even put into words what we feel. It's strong, we feel it strongly, but we don't often have words to put to what we, what we uh, know spiritually, know to be true. So I, I love, I love, I love them both. I love it all. And I think it's a, it's a credit to you, Margaret, that you continue to work with Congo. That didn't put you off. You know, you, no, you, you know, we can admire these elements that we all have within the family, which is quite, quite broad. And I, I want to just say that if this is the same, uh, these differences are very true for every global communion. So we, we hear this and, and hear the same experiences among the Lutherans, among the Seventh-day Adventists, among um, you know, the Catholic Church, you know, all of the different communions who have a global presence have, you know, usually more evangelical growth and activity in the, in the global south and, uh, and a more traditional church in more of the global north. Thank you, Gretchen. One of the questions that we had um, on the registration form actually uh, works quite well with this question. So I'm going to pose it to you now just while um, I encourage other people here in the Zoom room to ask their questions in live time. But the question that we had in advance was um, the non-theism seems to have increased in the Quaker circles and slash meetings. Mm. What are your reflections on this? And I know that you spoke about this a little bit in a recent video you did about um, how the Quaker uh, religion branch of Christianity um, traveled all around the world and what happened as it traveled around the world but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your reflections on this non-theism so I'll read the question again for you the non-theism seems to have increased in Quaker circles slash meetings what are your reflections on this yeah um, a lot of this it varies quite a lot around the world I would say you know and and uh Actually, here in the United Kingdom, I I I feel as though there's, it's uh, not as strong as it was ten years ago. Even I would guess. But having said that, um, I I think Quakers are known for, and we want to welcome people who are on a journey and who are you know considering what. Uh, for them, what for each of us is uh, is important in a spiritual sense. Um, my my hope would be that for anyone who is a, a non theist, that uh, they they can join the Quaker a Quaker meeting, a Quaker community, and be part of that. Um, and that anyone that they would not ask the community to uh, change for their sake. So, um, and what I mean by that is, it's important for people within a, a Quaker meeting or a Quaker church to talk about their faith using whatever 
theological terms work for them. And I'm a, I'm a great believer in you can change the words uh, if you need to in your head if they don't work for you. But don't ask everyone else to change for you. So I did this, let me give an example. When I was, uh, you know, I've always been a feminist. And when I was in college, I would be rather insistent that people change their language to be inclusive uh, you know, of women. I mean, I still do that on occasion, but I'm more selective about doing that. And I often just have learned to change in my head that language so that I don't feel angry about it or offended by it but that I can still in my own heart, hear it in a different way, in a way that would work so that I can hear it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, Linda, we have a question from you. So would you like to unmute and un ask your question to Gretchen? Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, and a particular thank you um, for your support for the Quaker Arts Network over, over your time at FWCC with the uh, International Peace Calendar we did and your, your, your early support for the Loving Earth Project, helping people to engage with environmental issues. Um, in the early days of Quakerism, of course, some um, visual arts in particular, but also music and other many other art forms, perhaps apart from poetry, were shunned. And I just wondered what your thoughts are about the potential for using the arts to, to support our Quaker spiritual development and, and our work in the world. Yeah, brilliant. Well, you've, you've been a great instigator of, of using the arts, Linda, and I, I think uh, people, I, I certainly appreciate it. And have really appreciated uh, the work you're doing in that regard. It has brought a lot of people to uh, an issue. Uh, there's, there's something about expressing oneself, whether it's through poetry or a song or, or artwork or the fabric arts to express something that is hard to put into words sometimes, or at least it gives us a visual so that we can really hold it differently. And I, I think that's brilliant. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a musician and played, you know this, I played in a band called Faith and Practice. And, uh, you know, we were quite irre irre irreverent. Um, and that was great fun to kind of poke a little fun at ourselves as Quakers. And, uh, you know, I always felt sad that early Quakers we weren't able to enjoy more of that, you know, that, that the piano would never be played at certain times or if they even had one, you know, it would. So um, I'm always grateful that in the current day, we can welcome more of that new kinds of expression. I think that's all, it's all helpful to our spiritual growth. Thank you, question. Hope that answered your questions, Linda. I'm going to call on Bob next. You had your hand. Bob, do you want to ask your question? I'd encourage you to unmute yourself before you do. Uh, th thank you, Faith. Um, I, I actually had two questions, but I think I want to actually do say something else instead with my time, and that's on the arts. Uh, um, my late wife uh, was an artist, and after she died, uh, I founded um, a, 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 a group called the Marianne Oberg Foundation for Spiritual Art. And I'm going to, in the uh, chat, put a link to the website. It's very simple. It's uh, mafsa.org. And any friends who are interested in uh, spirituality and art I, I would invite you to um, co contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And that's a lovely painting behind you. Yes, that's a painting that uh, a friend Carlos Alvarez did. Uh, and uh, that was based on one of Marianne's sculptures, which was an abstract uh, angel. And then he was inspired to create that uh, painting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Daniel in Brussels. Hi. Gretchen, best wishes to you and David on the next step in the adventure of your lives. Um, related to Linda's uh, uh, ministry, 
I, uh, as a follow-up to that, I was thrilled to see the trilingual uh, FWCC calendar. And I, I would ask you, uh, is any plans in the pipeline to uh, communicate with the support of all sections to communicate uh, in the future in uh, at least Spanish and, and French and perhaps other languages such as German because here on the continent, uh, Kirsten Mangles has published a great little booklet called 101 Ideas in Four Languages. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for your greetings. Um, yeah, it's, we don't have plan. I mean, who knows who, with the next general secretary, you know, they may jump on this idea and I'm sure uh, Linda will be in touch, but um, it was, it was a really very definitive decision to do the three languages. And it has to be every time because it's not, I mean, you know, it, it, it's very important. It, again, if we're welcoming and inclusive, uh, providing, you know, translations is hugely important. And uh, Faith is in the process now of uh, redoing our website, which we're doing, and we're planning to have some capacity, more capacity than we currently have to provide multiple languages. When we gather in, <clears throat> in the World Plenary Meeting, we always do uh, interpretation in English, French, and Spanish. And usually we have some Kiswahili friends who kind of sit together and, and get some, in, some translation if they need it, some interpretation if they need it. But those are the, um, you know, we kind of go by the UN. The UN has seven languages that they tend to use. So where friends are, Spanish, French, and English largely um, are the languages we would use. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I, 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 I like that question, Daniel. Watch the space is what I would say. <laughs> um, one, yeah, we're, we're redoing our website, so do um, keep a lookout for that, everybody. But also, um, it's about accessibility. How do we encourage people to be around our table? And that is also by first making people feel whatever they need in order to join, and then we can um, even things out from there. So. Thank you for asking those questions and encouraging us to to kind of push ourselves even more. Um, while we pause, there are no questions in our room. Um, I'm going to now ask you, Gretchen, a question that was again from our registrations um, about one of the programs that we run. So that's a sustainability program. And this and yes, thank you. And before I move on, just want to say. David from North Wales, a reminder about the Welsh language. Yes, on a personal note, my mum is learning Welsh after moving to Wales. So thank you for that. <laughs> See, we, we wouldn't be anywhere without all of you. Like this is that this community exists because of, of the suggestions that you make. So thank you. Um, okay, Gretchen, how can we best work with other groups of Quakers around the world to unite and action for climate change? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a huge issue and it's a huge question for us. We've, you know, FWCC's purpose really, our work is about creating networks of people and people that wanna join in can and do. And we have quite a, quite a network that works now. A Couple of things we've initiated uh, is, you know, Faith initiated a, a, a series of workshops for young people. So we have young friends who have really engaged uh, in this, Susanna Mattingly, who is the current um, sustainability um, officer, she, uh, uh, at the request of the heads of agencies that gather uh, uh, from around the world, Quaker heads, Quaker leaders, uh, that group has looked at how can we be more collaborative. And for sustainability, uh, Susanna has started now a group of Quakers from anywhere in the world, um, so that it's not just those heads that meet as an as agencies, but it, it's the kind of the next level down, and asking yearly meetings if they have people that want to be part of this 
ongoing um, network and dialogue that uh, to let us know. But there's a lot going on and there's an awful lot going on uh, in interfaith work around sustainability. So that, you know, we, we do many different groups. The one that I've been in most recently is a group that has met online six times. We use seven different language interpreters, by the way, a couple of different Chinese languages and so on. Um, and it's called Faith and Science. We have a scientist speak to us and, and then faith leaders. And I had an opportunity to be one of the presenters. And all of that will be put together to create a, a statement that will go to COP26 in Glasgow, which is the, you know, the UN uh, negotiations for sustainability. And our statement is going to be a very strong one uh, saying that faith leaders uh, are encouraging all governments to uh, respond to the climate crisis. So we're actually doing quite a lot of quite a lot of work. But as Quakers go, let us know if you want to be involved. We can hook you into any of our any of our networks. Thank you. Thank you. Hezron, would you like to ask your question? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gretchen, for the wonderful reflections. Mm. Thanks, and for your work here at NFWCC, and of course, we've interacted in other fields as well, and you've been very, very instrumental. Just want to go back to your example of the table. Mm -hmm. And I don't imagine a table where you have, you know, naughty kids and all that, and sometimes you're losing your cool because they're misbehaving. And I'm trying to imagine about your experiences traveling, you know, all over the world. And then meeting friends and uh, you know with all those diversities and all that and sometimes you just see things like how can I handle this? Um, so, so my question is that how do you how you manage to you know to respond and, and in just now so to speak like you know people are kind of different to bring and sit around with them on the same table if I may use that kind of imagery. Yeah, well, I think it helps, Hezron, that I've had children of my own, and so you know, I'm I'm quite happy to be around a table with uh, children in in any state of be, you know behaving well or not. But um, it's part of being the family. I mean, I had this image long, you know, in in Kabarak, you know, when I probably first met you. Um, to that, we're all coming to the table, and we don't know who's going to be there, you know. But you sit across from someone and. You know, it may be a long lost uncle of yours. It may be somebody that might even embarrass you a little bit, you know, or you think, wow, are they part of this family too? And then you go, yeah, of course they are. And let me just learn a little more about this funny person or, you know, if there's any oddity, it's okay. You know, it's just like, that's who they are and they're part of the family. And so, you know, we all have various family members that might, uh, interest us or embarrass us but it's all it's all part of the package yeah so i absolutely love that has run and you know i love the variety i you know if i think about the different tables i've sat at or the circles holding a plate on my lap or you know around a little table around by the couch you know they're just all of those all of those are very very precious to me yeah thanks has run I think you're muted, Faith. Can't hear you, Faith. Can you hear? Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so Roger, I'm going to call on you next. Thank you, Faith. Um, and uh, hi, Gretchen. Hi, Roger. Uh, I'm going to miss. I'm going to miss dropping in and uh, at friend's house and wasting your time. I already do because of course I haven't been around for some time, uh, but all the very best. Um, the, uh, I'm going back a bit in, in the discussion, uh, the, sort of the discussion of um, non-theism. Could you speak up, Roger? Get oh, close. sorry, I never get, quite sure what my microphone's doing. Get close to the mic. Is that better? Is that better? Yeah, I'd encourage yeah. you just to, to speak very loud if you can. <laughs> um, the um, question of, uh, 
non-theism raises always in my mind a, a, a question of language. Uh, we've talked about language in the conventional sense, but there's also the uh, differences in theological language that we have within our community. Um, and sometimes the, our differences of language get in the way. And I wondered how far we can uh, encourage friends to dig beyond the language to uh, the experience, because um, I've got a lot of sympathy with some of the things that non-theist friends say, but I find the language difficult. Um, uh, they find my language difficult. Uh, but I suspect that we have an enormous amount of common in terms of our experience. Now, whether that extends on to the wider Quake community, I don't know. But um, I wondered whether you had any thoughts about how we can dig beyond the language to the experience. Good. Thank you, Roger. That's it's a it's a great way that you've described that. I think, um, and I want to I want to give an example. I, I think it's a lot of work. Diversity is a lot of work, and it is a lot of work to hear someone in spite of something we disagree about or the language gets in the way. But the la language is one of our diversity elements, you know. So it is one of those things that I think we all have to keep working on or maybe we ask someone you know um what do you mean by that and div dig a little deeper into some of the meaning of language but i want to tell a quick story when we were in peru um we were of course we had booths for interpreters and so on and headsets and um there was a man who uh was from the the mountains in in bolivia and he spoke um, Amari. And so there was no interpretation for that, but he was a minute, a pastor and was uh, invited to give uh, the prayer. And when he gave this prayer, I mean, we didn't know the language, but he, he said it so passionately that people were in tears, people were crying. And, you know, it made me realize that really, we have a language of the heart. And I think I mentioned this in my talk, we have a language of the heart. And if we can hear that, if we can hear the heart speaking through whatever words we use, I think that's where, uh, where we have, uh, that's where we can come together. Thank you, Gretchen, couldn't agree more. Um, Leah, I see your hand is up as well, but I'm conscious that um, Nicole, you have your hand up and we've heard a few British friends. So I'm going to call on Nicole first. Leah, is that OK with you? Yeah, wonderful. So Nicole, would you like to ask your question? Well, it's a, it's a hello, Gretchen. It's, <laughs> it's also, um, I think as we talk about languages, uh, I'm reminding, reminded of uh, the verse, I don't, I'm not acquainted enough with the Bible to remember where it's from, but um, by their works, ye shall know them. Yeah. And I think especially in climate change, I'm impressed by the work of the young people and, uh, and how they go about their work. Uh, and I have found myself learning an awful lot uh, mm -hmm. from them. And partly because they are passionate, because it's their life that is being affected. And uh, but there's also all kinds of cultural differences that that seem to to get in the way sometimes. And I was just wondering, what is your experience of young people in at in FWCC in in your work around the world? Yeah. Good. That's a that's a great question, Nicole. Uh, you know, yeah. As you, I I learn so much always from young people, and um, I think it just engaging. It, it, part of it is just creating space, creating space mm -hmm. where they can be talking, uh, and then uh, you know, listening, listening to them, and asking again, having that curiosity is really important. Um, this project that Faith initiated uh, around sustainability, it was all planned by them. 
you know, organized by them. We just gave them the, the technology and the, you know, some administrative help, really. I mean, it was probably more than that. But anyway, we, that was, you know, it was their work. And in the end, they wrote a minute that they wanted to share with the rest of the Quaker world, with those of us who are, as Faith often says, young at heart, maybe, but not, <laughs> maybe not young of body, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, and, you know, we have a young adult uh fund, a young adult development fund, which was the money that was used for the Quaker Youth Pilgrimage at one time. And the idea behind that is, again, we take applications from anyone who wants, in particular, to work across the sections and encourage more intervisitation between the sections. And so, again, it's responsive to what young friends are feeling called and want to do. And mm -hmm. for, for the next World Plenary, we're planning, I hope, to have uh, a few days for young friends to meet ahead of the whole world plenary. And uh, yeah, so, you know, helping them come together, it's, it's a hard thing to organize. And, you know, we can help them organize if they want to do it. So, you know, that's, that's, I think, where we are in a good space. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Gretchen. Lee, would you like to ask your question? Oh, well, thanks, thanks, Faith. Um, it's a personal question, Gretchen. Um, <laughs> I mean, the role of general secretary um, of a world organization sounds exciting, um, possibly glamorous, um, but of <laughs> course, there's a huge amount of routine work, um, a lot of waiting in airports or waiting or late night Zoom or early morning Zoom calls, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've always appreciated about you is. Um, your consistent outward appearance of cheerfulness mm. um, and openness, um, your smile and your chuckle. Um, and so it hasn't always been meeting the Pope and um, the high spots of, um, of plenaries. Um, what, what, what has kept you personally upheld and, and going in what, what many would think is is an undoable job. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lee. It is an intense job, uh, no doubt, and it's a very full on full on job. I've always been committed to bringing my full self to whatever I'm doing, and <clears throat> so I've been grateful to be able to do that. I think it does take a good bit of stamina. Travel takes a good bit of stamina. You know, meeting new friends all the time takes a good bit of stamina. Um, and part of this job is administrative and, you know, thankfully it's working with a fantastic staff, um, which is great. And I've been lucky to have you and others on this call on my support committee. Uh, so I've, I've, and Jocelyn's on, is here and she set that up when I first started and I've been very grateful for that. Um, I've had many different kinds of support groups that, uh, you know, whether it's section section secretaries, whether it's uh, the, you know, uh, super, superintendents and secretaries in the US, whether it's the agency group, whether it's the leaders, Quaker leaders in the UK, all of those groups have been extremely uh, supportive and helpful. And especially during this COVID time, all of those groups have met more frequently. And uh, that's been extremely, extremely helpful. Um, so what has helped me? It's, it's, it's my faith, really, I would say, you know, if God, I've always said, if God leads me to it, God will help me through it. And um, I, I, I don't know if you've heard this story before, I'll tell it briefly, but um, when I had seen Nancy Irving about a year before uh, she left this position. And she said, oh, Gretchen, you might be interested in applying for this job. And I thought, oh yeah, that, that, that sounds great, you know? And I kind of forgot about it, honestly. And then I just, one day I was thinking about it. I like it popped into my head in big letters, you know, FWCC, you know? So I looked one on their website and it was the day before the applications were due. So I applied, <laughs> I thought, well, oh good, a day before I'll, you know, crank it out. 
and I applied and, and then I'm gratefully uh, am here. But it was it was really, truly a, a leading, a calling. I felt I felt called to this from the beginning and uh, throughout. I, I say all the time, a lot of you have heard me say, you know, I love this job and I've been um, extremely fortunate to be in this, to be doing this work, to be supporting friends, which I, you know, is at the heart of my life, uh, to support the society of friends in a way that I, uh, that I hope is, you know, enriching us and helping us be bigger, better, uh, you know, more faithful. So I, I guess it's the heart of that that uh, that really keeps me going. And all you, all of the friends I have made. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Gretchen. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to wrap up now because we have two minutes left, and there are so many more questions that um, we would like to ask you. Yeah, Gretchen, there's nine years of work and has got us to where we are. And there's many more years to come and we're, we're looking forward to welcoming a new secretary and seeing where that goes. But also Gretchen, in order to talk about preparing the table, I wonder if you could just share a little bit. There was one question that we had about um, global community addressing structural racism and transforming uh, inequalities in our society. And maybe you could just talk about the work that you have helped with the support of this committee to uh, work on our gathering uh, the next world gathering in South Africa and um, that might be a nice hopeful place to to lead on as well. Thank you. Thank you Faith. Yeah it's I think this is an issue you know structural racism uh, historical inequality it's something that the Central Executive Committee of FWCC is keen on working on and finding ways to do that. Um, we are looking toward as you said, Faith, the, the World Plenary Meeting in 2024 in South Africa in Durban. And uh, that will be a very rich opportunity to hear from friends there who have lived through apartheid and what, what was that like for them? Um, so we have, as I think I said in my, my wishes, there are many, many ways that we need to reinterpret you know, unlearn and relearn, and this is true for Quakers and every person on this earth, probably. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's big work, and it's work that we all, we all must do. And I think all of this need, just needs to be part of our, our conversation wherever we are, whatever we're doing. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of who we are and what our intention is of course to be welcoming and loving and it doesn't always work that way not because we're trying not to be that way a lot of times we think we're very welcoming when indeed you know as simple as uh finding someone's name hard to pronounce so we say oh forget it you know with that person you know no ask them how do you pronounce your name how do you spell it let's you know names are important and even when we can't even when they're less familiar to us. So that kind of thing, there's a lot for us all to learn and we will do that. I, I wanna say that as Quakers, you know, we keep at it, we keep at it. When, um, I'll just say briefly, when, when uh, President Trump was elected and I, we were devastated, the section secretaries were in The Hague when that, at a retreat when on that day. And I, we just decided we couldn't do business. We had to, you know, we had to grieve or do whatever. So I went out to the beach uh, and, you know, I thought, well, the waves still come up, you know, those beautiful birds still fly. And as Quakers, we just kind of keep doing what we do. You know, we keep, we keep going to meeting and to church. We keep uh, learning what we can do to address issues of our world. And that's just what we all, we all keep working toward a better world. So, thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. You will be missed. So, thank you for coming to join us today. Just a few technical points to finish on. Um, the session will be recorded, or it has been recorded, and a recording will go up in July. And um, we have a few 
um, staff off. We're a tiny team, but we have a few staff off next week. So there'll be a bit of delay on the recording this time, but it will go up in July. Um, we encourage you to share it with friends and also to, um, on a personal note, if there's one person that you can talk to about something that you learned today, so not just to share the recording, but to share your reflection with somebody um, in your family or your friendship group, they can be a Quaker or non-Quaker, but share something that you've learned today. That would be nice. And if you would like to share that with us, then please do. On another note about sharing reflections with us, um, this is the last session in our Quaker Conversations series. Um, we're going to take a little break and we'll come back in October. Um, and before we come back, we want to hear from you about how the sessions have gone. So there's a short survey which takes around 10 minutes. Um, and I really welcome uh, all the reflections that you can. Um, so it's on the, the, the series as a whole and your suggestions next. And I'm just going to find that for you and put it in the chat. There we go. And uh, when we do send round the recording, I'll, I'll remind you of that survey so you can, can have a look. Um, and on another note, um, Gretchen, it was announced uh, yesterday that Gretchen will be stepping back from her position. We've known for a while, but it's finally been agreed. <laughs> She'll be stepping back in July 23rd and moving on to be the Dean at Earlham School of Religion, which is very exciting and Gretchen's next calling and we wish her every luck in the next opportunity. And we also then ask for your, uh, well, just to uphold the, the search committee as they are working really hard and I can see a few of you here today um, to appoint the next General Secretary. So. Gretchen, have I missed anything? Have, have we? No, we're good. Okay. We're good. All right. Simon had his hand up earlier. I don't know if he has something he wanted to say. I do indeed. I think this is probably the last time we will have an opportunity as a group to express our gratitude to you, Gretchen. You've done a wonderful job. <laughs> and, uh, I've had the privilege of working with you over this five year period, and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I just want to, on behalf of the world community of friends, express our gratitude to you for what you've done. Thank you, Simon. Your tears mean a lot to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Don't be a stranger. We'll Thank meet you, again. friends.